Um, good evening. Thank you for coming to the Lakewood West Neighborhood Association. Um, this has been an ongoing kind of like traditional meeting every year in June. I'm just sorry more people from our neighborhood haven't shown up, but I appreciate all of you um, city officials that have come. Please sign in on the sign-in sheet before you leave so I know and put your title or whatever so I know who was here. And um, again, I appreciate you coming and hopefully next time it'll be a little bit more, a little more people. And I'll announce um, Mayor Berger here. Thank you very much. We appreciate being invited back. Um, maybe it could be that the um, uh, folks aren't, don't show up because we're here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is comfortable. We appreciate being here, and uh, as it's been the. Tradition, our city focus meeting moves around the community to various neighborhood groups um, to uh, uh, have city officials present to talk about current events and um, uh, things that are going on that would be of interest and to answer any questions that folks might have. So I want to begin uh, just by introducing uh, Sharita Smith, who is the city chief of staff who joined uh, the uh, staff at the end of uh, um, January and uh, now that she's an expert in everything with the city we're gonna have her come up first <laughs> and uh, and actually talk about a special project that she's heading up so Sharita Thank you, Mayor Berger. <laughs> what you get for being the new kid on the block right um, as Mayor Berger said, um, I'm Sharita Smith, I'm the Chief of Staff, um, and a lot of people ask, so what is your job? So primarily, I basically serve as a liaison between Mayor Berger and all of the stakeholders in our community, including the Neighborhood Association, City Council, and the rest of the administrative staff. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk to you about, I also do special projects, and a special project that I've been working on since January is a partnership with a nonprofit out of Columbus um, entitled Clean Fuels Ohio. Um, what Clean Fuels Ohio does is they go out and they identify governmental bodies and they help them move their vehicle fleets from traditional use of either gasoline or diesel fuels to alternative fuel use. And we've been working with them um, we've identified five community partners that we're working with. We're in partnership with the Regional Transit Authority, the Regional Planning Commission, um, as well as uh, WOCAP, formerly known as LACA, and also um, ODOT, the Ohio Department of Transportation. And so what we're doing now is we've collected data about all of our vehicle fleets, and we're going to be applying for a grant with the state of Ohio to do what's called a feasibility study, where they will analyze our fleets and come back and tell us the most efficient and cost-effective way to take our fleets green if, if it works for our community. So I'm very excited about that, um, and that's just one of the great things that I've been able to do since I've had the opportunity to come back home and serve the community so thank you all you know there's there's a lot of discussion uh, about climate change and um, what it is that um, the nation can do but we know that those things that um, ultimately matter happen in a specific locale it's what we do it's how we react to uh, opportunities and so this is very much an opportunity for us to consider uh, both new and emerging technologies that can be used on whether it's our dump trucks or our police vehicles or uh, in some instances the city's the city buses uh, the entire range of vehicles to actually look at um, um, those technologies and 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 hopefully see opportunities to change and ultimately reduce emissions increase mileage all those kinds of things that are part and parcel of what we as a nation have to do to, to uh, be in somewhat uh, uh, sync with uh, uh, nations of the world that are all looking at how to how to do better for our environment. So I want to also ask the next newest 
person on the city staff, Susan Crotty. Uh, she became the community development director uh, for the city in um, November and um, is now well into all of the functions in, in her department, having just uh, brought on some new staff as well. Susan? Well, thank you, but uh, putting me on the spot, because this is the first one of these meetings that I've attended, so uh, bear with me. But um, I've been talking a lot about one of the things my office does is manage the community development block grant. And uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about that. We're still waiting to hear what kind of funding we're going to get. Um, so since uh, I've already uh, been on, you know, on the news talking a lot about that lately, I thought I'd focus on some other areas of the department, and uh, one of them being property maintenance. And we do have uh, two new inspectors that you'll be seeing out on the streets, especially in this area. Um, we're going to have new staff that's going to be um, working in this neighborhood. Um, but we, uh, David Williamson and Brandon White, uh, both just started a week ago. And um, they're getting their feet wet. They're both coming along really well, learning our codes and learning the neighborhoods. So you'll see them out. Um, you know, if you need assistance, they'll be the people that you'll be talking to. Um, so we're real excited to have them on board because we have been short staffed. Um, you know, we try to keep up with complaints and do some proactive code enforcement. And I've, you said, you know, code enforcement can't win. Um, <laughs> some people want them to be more aggressive. Some people say they're too aggressive. Um, so please, uh, you know, understand their situation. They're trying to do their jobs. And uh, they're also the people that you can go to for help. I was just talking to Bob about that a little bit. Um, one of the things they focus on right now, they're really gearing up with uh, weeds, uh, sending out notices, and also, um, mowing our specified parcels, what we call specified parcels. Uh, that's a list of properties that we're having trouble um, contacting the owners or getting responses from the owners on. Um, we actually have about 600 parcels in the city um, that are problems for us. Sometimes um, the owner's deceased or um, you know they're out of town and we just can't get in touch with them. So what the city does is we actually go out and mow those and we do assess uh, the owners for the cost of mowing. Um, so we do recoup most of our costs on that, but um, you know it is something that the city does for the neighborhoods. I think sometimes though, when we go out and mow, we go out and stake property. So you'll see stakes in the ground with a piece of paper on them. And those are specified parcels that the city's mowing. I think sometimes because we're mowing them, people think we own them, and we do not. The city does not own those properties. But since they are often tax delinquent, we can't get a hold of the owners, we can expedite foreclosure sometimes on those and transfer them to the neighboring owners. Um, that's through our side lot program, and the land bank actually handles that. So we encourage people, you know, if the city's mowing a property and the neighboring uh, property owner would like to acquire it, we encourage them to call our land bank and see if that's an opportunity. You never know, every situation's different. And before we go through that process and transfer property to a neighboring owner, we do need to make sure that that uh, potential owner keeps up on their taxes as well and also does not have any uh, property maintenance violations. So you do have to be eligible and um, you know the property has to be eligible for it as well. But uh, we always encourage you to call the city and ask about that. Um, that's one of the things that the city of Lima Land Bank does and that's also out of my department. Uh, the county also has a land bank and I sit on that board. Um, and a lot of people are seeing activity from the county and are hearing a lot about that. The county's going out and demolishing a lot of the um, dilapidated structures, which is great. You know, again, we're, we support that. We're working with the county on that. Um, but the city's land bank uh, focuses a lot on the side lot transfers and also on we have some properties that we've assembled for future development. And so we're going to be pursuing that more uh, to transfer those properties. The city doesn't want to be in the business of owning a lot of property. We don't want to just be out there holding on to these properties. It really doesn't do us any good. We want to develop them or to work with neighboring property owners to get them in their hands. Um, we're also looking at some opportunities for some infill development, meaning um, you know, the possibility of encouraging private developers to build houses on vacant lots in the city. 
So um, those are some things that we work on um, out of our office. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention is just give everybody an update on the um, bank building project at 43 Town Square downtown. Um, you know, we are working with a private developer. We uh, were able to secure a developer by encouraging them uh, with the assistance of financing with our home program. And uh, that project is still moving forward. Uh, they are planning to renovate the building into um, residential, to a multi-use uh, function. They will be residential uses on the top floors and commercial on the first floor. Um, they are still planning to start construction on that on August 15th. That's the target date now. Um, you know, we are planning to close here in the next uh, few weeks. Um, so we're anxious to get that started and that'll be a nice addition to town and it'll bring more traffic downtown which will we hope will encourage future development as well that's all I have for tonight unless um, there are questions or Any questions I do also I have uh, good neighbor guides which talk a little bit about uh, property maintenance uh, and give you phone numbers to contact as well if anybody's interested okay thank you Susan Rick Stolle parks director is here with update on well, this is that time of the year when your, your team is <laughs> fully, this is this is that time of year we're very busy As a matter of fact i am going to sneak out a little bit early we've got games going on over at uh fro to the tournament for our youth little league guys are going on and uh with the weather and so forth we got some decisions to make but anyways a little bit about what's going on uh, of course our mentioned our little league uh, activity started back in may we're going to go up through about the fourth of july with that activity the pool just opened up this past weekend. Uh, great weekend to start to get the pool up and running with the temperatures we've had. Been very busy um, Sunday, Monday, and then of course again today. Um, so uh, we look forward to another good year at the pool. Um, we also started our playground program uh, yesterday. So we have youth at four different spots, Dr. Martin Luther King, Rob, Lincoln, and Froat. Uh, so we're very busy with those kids, getting them acquainted with all the things that uh, come with the playground program and our leadership there with local uh, high school and college students helping us uh, to run that. The uh, Probably the biggest uh, bit of news, um, if you've been reading the paper or paying attention, um, we uh, went to council last week, uh, last Monday night, and um, talked about the opportunities that we have with uh, a restructuring, not a restructure, but a redevelopment of our um, playground sites. Um, the equipment has become somewhat um, antiquated and uh, we're going to be doing a number of different uh, processes uh, in phases. Uh, this summer we're starting with four sites, um, two uh, playgrounds at Froat, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Park, um, and then we're also going to be working up at Rob. So our, our early estimates come in a little over 200, 210, 215,000 that we're going to be working with um, to replace everything from the ground up uh, at most of those sites and uh, surface, curbing, equipment. Um, and this is phase one. We look to complete that project over a four year period. Again, this will be done with public funds and private funds and we're well on our way visiting with some of uh, the friends in the community to talk about their uh, want to uh, invest in uh, in continuing to keep our playground sites uh, up to where they need to be um, so along with our general fund we'll see how that process goes through the next four years but it's gonna be a challenging but yet a very aggressive approach to uh, to bring those sites up to uh, standards and going to be all inclusive uh, sites where we're working with the entire community, handicapped children and, and adults and so forth uh, as we move that process. We, we don't have a lot of that right now at our playground site. So it's one of the focuses we really want to, uh, to move forward on. So with all that said, uh, we're uh, looking forward to a great summer. Uh, get out, enjoy the parks and uh, uh, bring the family and have a great time. Mayor. Very good. Thanks, Rick. And of course, in addition to those activities, I don't know that you mentioned the Locos, but the Locos are off uh, with, and running with their season, and uh, uh, they're two and one.
this point. So we hope to see this be another winning, hopefully, championship season for Follow the local. tonight and tomorrow night back in town uh, Thursday. And the investments that have been made at Simmons Field really are beautiful. I mean, they're functional, but they're also beautiful. So we want to encourage people to come out to see the Locos play uh, and uh, enjoy those those facilities. So thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Chief Martin is here as well, the Lima Police Department, to uh, talk about uh, you've been actually in the media quite a bit the last week. Yeah, a little bit more than I'd care to be, but uh, I guess it just comes with the job. Uh, if I can back up just for a moment, though, with the um, – Clean Fuels Initiative, I'd just like to say that uh, as the police chief, what excites me about that most uh, is actually the potential cost savings. Uh, the police department, we put uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles on our vehicles each year. And if these technologies will help us to cut down on our fuel expenses, uh, that is going to be a huge benefit for the police department and even more importantly, a huge benefit for the taxpayers. So that, that's actually what I'm most excited about with that project. Um, I will also just like to say that uh, our crime numbers actually are looking very good so far for the year. Uh, in looking at 2017 compared to 2016, uh, through January 1 through May, um, in 2017 our overall crime is down uh, by just under 13 percent or 12.9 percent to be exact. Uh, and even more importantly, our violent crime is down by more than 21 percent for this for the first five months this year compared to the first five months last year. Now, I am going to have to qualify that by saying that, in my opinion, one crime is one crime too many. And I always have to be very careful to not come off when I'm talking about the crime numbers like I'm some kind of a bean counter. Because when we're talking about crime victims, we're talking about real people, people whose lives have been, uh, in some cases, absolutely devastated as a result of, of the criminal activity that occurs. But it is still important that we look at those numbers to see if what we're doing is working or if it's not. Uh, and one of the things I will say that when we saw the increase in uh, the crime numbers last year, we were not just looking at the numbers themselves, but we were trying to look for root causes. And we were trying to apply pressure in the locations where those things were happening the most. Uh, and I believe that, that those efforts um, are starting to pay off. Our investigators, the Detective Bureau, they have been working an incredible amount of overtime uh, and they have really been breaking their backs trying to make sure that they get the bad guys off the street before they can hurt more people. I think that's starting to pay dividends. Our patrol officers through their pinpoint policing efforts have been doing an incredible job. Uh, many people may have heard of the so-called Ferguson effect. That was a term that was coined or phrased by the uh, former FBI director James Comey. And in short, the Ferguson effect was just a way of describing that in many locations, police officers are afraid to do their job because of the potentially negative um, media scrutiny and public scrutiny that can come if they make a mistake. Well, I'm going to tell you that the Ferguson effect does not exist in Lima. In 2016, when our violent crime numbers were going up, the officers did not back off their efforts. And in fact, our pinpoint officers confiscated 102 illegal weapons off the street. That was compared to 52 illegal weapons that were seized the, the prior year. And when you think of those 102 weapons that were seized by officers from people who were uh, possessing and carrying them illegally, that's 102 opportunities that the bad guys had to keep a police officer from going home again to ever see their family at the end of the shift. That was 102 opportunities that that officer had to put themselves into the potential of, of a field of fire, but they did so without reservation, without hesitation, because they know it's the right thing to do to protect this community. Uh, and so again, I, I'm very, very proud of all the work that's being done by our detectives. I'm incredibly proud of the work that's being done by our patrol officers. And so I think it's important for the community to take time to, to uh, just, just if you have the opportunity, if you see an officer and, and they're not tied up on something, you know. Give them a wave, maybe say thank you to them or whatever, because, again, they are out there every day doing an incredible job. Uh, the last thing I will say in terms of the crime numbers is that if you compare them to 2015, the prior year, uh, we are actually right on target to um, match or even beat that year in terms of having lower numbers than 15. And the reason why that's important is because 2015 um, was actually the lowest year we've seen in quite a while. 
And in 2015, if you compare it to 2008, which was the last year before we implemented pinpoint policing, uh, the violent crime in 2015 was about 40 percent less than it was in 2008. So again, those are significant impacts that the work is doing. But I also have to say with that, uh, again, much of the success that the investigators have been having, much of the success that the patrol officers are having is because of information that is being given to them by the public. And so, again, as we are not going to rest on our laurels, as we are not going to slow down in our efforts, I ask that the community uh, likewise step up in uh, efforts to make sure that, that the police department knows what's going on. Make sure that you get acquainted with the officers that are working in your neighborhood every day. Uh, and, and be willing to give us that information and help us to know what's going on so that we can uh, better serve this community. Thank you. One uh, pretty visible way that uh, I think the public um, engages with the police department is through social media. And, um, you know, I, I've been amazed at the um, how often when the department actually posts pictures or information or is seeking information for whether it could be a missing child or, uh, or a perpetrator of some sort, uh, the public responds. And we really uh, appreciate the fact that that's occurring and, and uh, think that it ultimately leads to the kind of positive resolutions we want. So um, Mike Caprella, the new utilities director. Mike, he's, he's, he's the old, old new utilities director for the city. He took uh, Gary Sheely's place uh, in, in the fall and uh, he's become an expert on uh, trash. He used to hate doing trash and refuse, but now he's an expert on garbage. Right? I'm not going to talk about garbage either, so I'll just so you know. We'll talk about sewers maybe, but not garbage, so. I wasn't sure I was even going to be here tonight. I've spent the last three and a half days at a National American Water Works meeting in Philadelphia, a very intense training session, a good meeting. But I just flew back, got back into, my arms are tired too, man. It was a long flight, so. But I... That was for the chief to kind of lighten him up a little bit, you know. He said, "No, but um, I, I just got back in town about ten after five, so I was I didn't know if I was going to make it, so I'm not prepared, but I can still talk. I mean, it's not a problem. We have a lot going on in our department right now, besides the trash part that the mayor referenced. We also do water and sewer, and we maintain all the system, the water, 450 some miles of water lines and 350 some miles of buried sewer lines. We have a large very modern water treatment plant and we have a very large newly modernized wastewater plant as most of you know we're under a consent decree with us epa on the wastewater side and we're going to end up spending probably 150 million dollars because of this consent decree and we're right in the middle of it right now we just finished up or are in the process of finishing up. Most of the construction is completed at the wastewater plant. It's a $29 million project at the Headworks, which almost doubled the capacity for our treatment at that plant and kind of modernized it a little bit. Very nice project. That was a worthwhile project, I think, under the consent decree. We're also halfway, or actually 60% of the way through the design of a new combined sewer overflow basin it's going to cost us $40 million. It's going to be built out on Simmons Field, away from the ballpark, by the way. We're not going to interfere with the ballpark, but it's going to be a very large, it's going to be a 13 million gallon basin, which is huge. I mean, if you, if you think about the water tower out on Medcalf Street, the large tower across from the refinery, that holds 1 million. So you think about 13 of them buried in it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a large basin, it's going to be buried. Got a blast rock out. It's going to be underground with dirt on top. Once we're done, other than a small building for the pumps and for air, some air handling, you won't know that tank's there. But starting next year when we start construction, you're going to know we're there. I'd like to coincide it with the Locos games because they're going to be blasting that rock. So if we could just match it up each time chief's got me code each time there's a home run we get boom blow something up there and rock flying up in the air that would be neat stuff you know 
Look, remember, I'm tired and fatigued from that long flight. I'm, just, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> but, but we are going to be doing what I'm saying is true. We're going to be blowing up the, the, the rock, and it's going to be a very, very large excavation, probably two years worth of construction, and that'll be the next phase of our consent decree. And we're ahead of schedule on that also because with the help of the mayor and some of the contacts we've made with the Ohio EPA and the funding people with the EPA, we were able to land some decent rates for borrowing money to do that basin. And But by getting, being able to get that money, we had to accelerate our schedule. So we are, and it's kind of good because we're ahead of the curve because we have to have certain things done. There, there, are, there are target dates that have to be met with the EPA. This is the United States EPA, not the Ohio EPA. So they're a little more stringent, I think, than the Ohio people. A little nastier. This on TV? Okay. I, say na I didn't say nasty, did I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and so all that's going on. Uh, we've also done the supplemental project along the river. There's 213 new trees planted, and I think all of them seem to be growing. And when they start getting larger, that's going to beautify the river for all the way from Main Street out to close to our wastewater plant. So a lot of, a lot of trees there. On the water side, there's good news, although a lot of people are getting tired of the rain. You know, rain is good because that's our water source. And when it rains, the rivers come up, and we've been able to fill all of our reservoirs. And right now, they're all just about full, which is about 15 billion gallons of water. A lot of water out there. So we're full, and that's a good thing. So other than that, we're in good shape everywhere. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. And Chief Black from Lima Fire Department. Chief? Thanks, Mayor. Well, uh, first thing I'd like to uh, congratulate the condition of the, the old station here. It looks really nice. Uh, it's been a little while since I've been in here, but I did spend a lot of time here when I was uh, younger working as a firefighter and a company officer, so it really looks nice here. I want to go real quick and uh, tell you about the operations of the fire department. Uh, uh, right now, we are running out of uh, three fire stations, the uh, north end at Rob and West, uh, the central fire station down on South Main Street, and the south end station, station number two, uh, at uh, 3rd Street in Branson. So our minimum staffing level is uh, 16 certified firefighters at uh, three different levels of medical training. Uh, we have a few first responders still left. Uh, most of them, though, are EMT basics and uh, paramedics. Uh, at our downtown station, um, we do man two ambulances around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And those ambulances are advanced life support ambulances. Uh, we also man an engine downtown with three firefighters on it. Uh, we man uh, a heavy rescue unit uh, with two firefighters on it, and we can cross man a 100-foot platform aerial device uh, from one of the other trucks, and we also have a reserve ambulance downtown. Uh, each of the two outstations have an engine company in each of the two outstations with three firefighters on them. Uh, almost all the time, those engine companies are advanced life support engine companies that do respond on uh, with the ambulance, ambulances on medical calls. Um, we were, we were running roughly now about 5,300 calls a year. And out of that 5,300 calls a year, about 75% of them are medical. Uh, we still have a fairly large number of house fires within the city of Lima, but even those numbers have been decreasing over the last 10 years. So um, we do have our own uh, fire prevention bureau uh, with uh, Chris Jackson, Warren Pugsley in it. And what they do is they do fire safety inspections of all commercial of commercial buildings throughout the city of Lima. They also do the fire education programs in the uh, elementary schools and also at Safety City. Uh, we do have our own uh, arson investigator. Uh, he's in charge of investigating our structure fires. They don't have to be arson for him to investigate, but he works with the also the uh, local insurance companies uh, with uh, should uh, structure catch fire and uh, the structure is insured with an insurance company he works with them as far as doing the investigation and getting them information uh, a few things that are coming up for us over the next few months we're losing some very long time employees over the next four to five months 
Uh, we lost uh, Chief Effner last year, who retired after th almost 31 years of service with the city. Uh, I'm losing uh, Deputy Chief this year. Uh, let, he'll be leaving here next month, uh, finishing out his career on vacation, and he'll be retire, retiring later on this year, uh, Ed Howard. He'll have, Ed has 34 years of service with the city of Lima. So we're going to be losing a lot of experience with him. We're losing uh, two captains, uh, Rich Reif, that has 33 years of service with the city, and Jeff Thompson is a captain who has 34 years of service with the city. They will be leaving. And so our big project coming up this over the next uh, few months is we're going to be hiring four to five new firefighters within the city. So we do have a current list right now that we'll be hiring off of, but next year we'll probably have another list. So if you have any family or friends that are interested in the position, a firefighter with the city of Lima, probably summertime or fall, we'll be having another firefighter's test of next year. So any questions? Yeah, uh, we did uh, council uh, council uh, approved uh, uh, so ordering a new fire truck. It's uh, the most expensive truck we've ever purchased. Uh, it's seven hundred eighty-five thousand uh, dollars. It's a uh, it's a f engine Quint truck. That truck will be going downtown as our f our number one engine. So uh, that'll be coming in uh, probably in December January of uh, the, the, either late this year, early next year. So we're Happy to have that coming. It'll be replacing a truck that's uh, that this fall will be 24 years old, and that truck is it's it's tired, and it's time to replace it. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. I I think it's both for um, the fire department and the police department. Um, we should note that the many of the responding incidents uh, uh, throughout our community uh, is being precipitated by the, the opioid crisis. And so uh, police officers are showing up, uh, uh, firemen are showing up, ambulances are showing up in order to uh, um, re uh, revive folks. Um, and that's happening um, based on what I'm hearing on a daily basis. We're not talking about something that is once a month. And um, I think our community needs to be uh, aware of applauding the services of, of all of our um, medical and and safety service personnel who are in fact running themselves ragged trying to respond to this crisis um, and um, uh, in addition to the treatment options that are being expanded in our community folks need to know that our safety services are fully engaged uh, trying to deal with the consequences of what's happening so we appreciate that uh, Steve Cleves, the finance director, is here as well. Uh, Steve, I don't see any charts. No, ch no charts. <laughs> he was busy today. <laughs> yeah, we had a busy day today, uh, fire chief and myself and a couple of others. Um, we will be having a uh, review of our uh, first half activity uh, as compared to our budget uh, uh, sometime uh, next month. Uh, as June closes, uh, I can say at at this time that our uh, our spending is tracking uh, with our budget, slightly under the budget, and uh, I, th I think we're we're pretty much on target to uh, to meet our budgeted numbers uh, at the end of the year on the spending side. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of progress that's been referred to by the two chiefs, and uh, in the parks, and also in the streets when when Warner gets up here. And a lot of that is, is due to the fact that we've been able to add personnel and equipment over the last few years, and, and we are continuing to do that. Uh, and that's because the city has the, the financial strength to be able to absorb those costs. And uh, the goal is to keep that strength uh, strong so uh, we can continue to do that on into the future. Uh, one concern I have is uh, the state continues to figure out ways to take money out of our pockets uh, in all of the local cities uh, and, and governments throughout the uh, state. Their latest activity is to uh, propose collecting uh, business taxes in Columbus and then subtracting 1% of it and sending, it and sending the remainder back to us. 
that's just one more little nick against our uh, revenue stream. Uh, the most troublesome part of that is not really the 1%, but it's the fact that the uh, local governments lose the authority to audit people who they suspect are not paying their taxes or are underpaying their taxes. That authority will ride uh, strictly with the tax uh, people in Columbus. And uh, frankly, they don't have the personnel or the resources to track all the taxes for every business in, in the state of Ohio. There's just no way they're going to be able to do it, so they're not going to do it. So I mean, that's my prime concern uh, with this legislation that's pending in the uh, state house. But uh, we've lost an average of, uh, you know, over the last 10 years as the state keeps whittling away from various uh, fund sources, uh, about two and a half million dollars a year. And, you know, that's, that's a whole lot of money. That's, uh, it's almost 10% of our general fund budget. So uh, we've absorbed that. We've managed to keep ourselves in pretty good shape and we're moving forward. But uh, uh, that does that does hurt. And it not only, only hurts this city, but it hurts uh, all cities uh, ac across the state. I think maybe we've handled it a little bit better than most, but uh, we would be in even better shape if we had those funds. Again, when you think about the, whether it's the equipment that uh, the chief was referencing, you know, eight hundred thousand dollars for a piece of equipment, and we've got we've lost two and a half million. That's on an annual basis, uh, or the kind of manpower that we need, um, or the uh, Rick was talking about the parks equipment. Um, uh, this uh, overall plan is uh, about eight hundred thousand dollars in spending over the next several years. All of that would be, we'd be in much better condition uh, to be able to deal with those kinds of needs if the state hadn't been, frankly, stealing our money. So uh, we also have Warner Roach here. Warner also joined us uh, last summer. Uh, he's the uh, uh, deputy director in charge of the Streets Department and Public Works. Warner. Thank you, Dave. Um, I actually celebrated a year last week. This is one of my first duties uh, to come to LACNEP and talk about the streets division, not knowing anything about it. Um, we have different seasons that we go through, okay? Um, leaf season's always uh, a lot of fun. Um, but right now we're, we're doing alleys. I just want to focus on, on that. Um, we are about, just about a little bit away from halfway done, being halfway done. We started on the north end of the city, um, went east, and now are into the south, and we'll, con we'll finish up on the west side. But um, if we do one alley, when it, when it all starts out, our phones start ringing, like, you haven't gotten my alley yet. Okay, so we, we ask people to please just, just be patient with us. What we're doing, what we have to do this year is take a lot of, lot of dirt away, a lot of material away from the alleys. It's a lot has grown up, and, and leveling them off and making sure that uh, the water that Mike talked about water flows away from them in the right direction not flood folks backyard and stuff like that So it's more than just going and, and cleaning up an alley. Uh, we trim the trees away that have overgrown and um, It takes a lot of work and a lot of manpower. So please be patient with us because um, uh, we'll, we'll get to you. We, we just have it's a lot to do and we want to make sure when we do it We do the, the, the right thing. Okay. Thanks. Any other, any questions, comments? Autumn, did you have something that you want to share on behalf of the neighborhoods? Oh, not exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Sergeant, nothing? Steve, anything from your perspective? Nothing? All right. Well, we appreciate being invited, and uh, we're always glad to share what's going on uh, with the city. One thing I'll mention to you, um, you know, we did just dedicate um, the new Lima Stadium Park just a couple weeks ago, and I came by actually 
um, earlier today and there were just hordes of kids and families at the new splash pad there. Uh, but something that really hasn't been uh, called to folks' attention much is uh, the fact that uh, um, those lights at, or those, the fountains at night are lighted. They've got colored lights. So when those fountains are uh, operating, um, even though there may not be people in the park, uh, it's really kind of a beautiful entry feature for, for the community. So uh, we want to call, call attention to that, encourage people to drive by. Uh, I uh, came by last Friday. I didn't have my uh, uh, phone with me, so I would have taken a picture. But nobody's yet captured a picture of those light of the fountain with, as as it's been lit. So I want to encourage people to perhaps share that so people know it's uh, part of the uh, the new uh, uh, stadium park. We also have had um, there's a, a lot of comments from uh, folks that are planning events at the uh, stadium. Uh, they see the, the park as a major new uh, reason why they would have events at the stadium. And uh, so we're encouraging people to, uh, uh, to consider uh, holding, whether it's reunion parties, particularly if they're with one of the schools in the community, or other kinds of events that might take advantage of, of those facilities. So we appreciate uh, being invited tonight. Uh, thank you for uh, letting us address you. and. Uh, we look forward to perhaps coming back next year as well. Thank you all.